let's let's go back. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Decky Alexander. Um, and in this space, I'm a professor at Eastern Michigan University. I am a faculty associate for the EMU Center for Jewish Studies. And um, I also oversee Engaged EMU, which is EMU's front door to the university. And one of our programs, which we launched in 2019, which was the inaugural Kirk and Sharon Profit Social Justice fellowship. Uh, and for those of you who may not know Kirk Prophet, he's an EMU alum. He was a, a state rep. <clears throat> he has uh, been on EMU's foundation board. He is a lobbyist for several universities, and he's a real big advocate of educating through justice and is the sponsor and supporter of this fellowship, which I'll tell you a little bit about. So what this fellowship, and this is our inaugural one, it, pro it provides uh, an individual or team of EMU full-time lecturers or tenure track faculty an opportunity to engage in public research focused on, on issues of justice, uh, whether they be racial or gender or economic or religious. And this social justice fellowship reinforces and elevates our Carnegie classification and our mission, which is really to benefit the local and global communities. And this particular, in particular inaugural fellowship is in partnership uh, with the EMU Center for Jewish Studies. And my, my colleague here, Dr. Marty Schickman, is the director and an amazing collaborator and partner. And this fellowship, we really uh, put a call out uh, to focus on addressing social issues, justice issues related to the Jewish experience including but not limited to Jewish interrelations or the civil rights movement and Jews in labor. And so a lot of our presentation and our, our presentation reflects that particular direction in this fellowship. Let me give you a little bit of background on the Center for Jewish Studies. Um, as I said, it's presented in part, it's co-sponsored by the center, which offers classes in Jewish life and culture, both on campus and on the road, you might have seen Marty and Dr. Bernstein travel around the country to various uh, locations and locales in places as far as Germany, Poland, Spain, and Israel. The Center for Jewish Studies sponsors faculty and student research such as this, and is responsible for a well-known lecture and performance series that on Wednesday, December 8th at 7 p.m. in the EMU Student Center Auditorium will present a post Hanukkah celebration Donnie Zaz, oh my God, sorry, Marty. Donnie Zazloff and Eric Lindbergh, Jews, Bluegrass, and other American musics, a conversation and a concert. If you want more information, we'll also put that in the bio today to get you information. Is it also virtual too? Is it only face-to-face, -face, Marty? It's both? It's both? Okay. It's All both. right, wonderful. All right, well, now we'll get to our presentation. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, our first fellow, Dr. Murphy. Oh, first of all, I want to welcome everybody here, including uh, all my colleagues, my friends, and my students, and uh, Dr. Murphy's parents and all of Dr. Murphy's friends. I think that was very important to say. All right. This is a family show and a family experience, and we're so glad to have our community here locally and across the country participate. So, Dr. Murphy, Mary Elizabeth Emmy Murphy is an associate professor and chair of history at Eastern Michigan University. She is the author of Jim Crow Capital, Women and Black Freedom Struggles in Washington, DC, 1920 to 1945, which was published with the, with the University of North Carolina Press in 2018. Her articles have appeared in Teaching History, the Oxford Research Encyclopedia of American History, Washington History, and the Washington Post, which a lot of us read over uh, this past year uh, during COVID. Her 2017 article, The Servant Campaigns, was published in a special issue of the German Journal, Journal of Urban History and received the honorable mention for the best article in African American Women's History by the Association for Black Women Historians. In 2019, Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission, an arm of the Library of Congress and the U.S. National Archives, appointed her as a scholar expert in the celebration of the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. And she has lectured about Black women and voting rights around the country. She is currently working, writing a book entitled Policing Passengers, Black Women, Bus Corporations, and Racial Violence in the Great Migrations. It is such an honor for our inaugural fellow uh, to be Dr. Murphy, so I'll, I'll send it to you. And, and friends, if you want to put it on speaker, you'll have Dr. Murphy 
just her face and not mine. Okay, thanks so much. We'll see you in a bit. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So my title, the, talk, the title of my talk this evening is Riding in Solidarity, Jewish Americans, African Americans, and the Fight Against Bus Segregation. So in my talk this evening, I'm going to highlight my research as the inaugural Kirk and Sharon, Karen, Sharon Prophet Social Justice Fellow. I'm going to talk a little bit about the origins of the Black Jewish Alliance, and then I'm going to look at three moments when Jewish Americans were allied with African Americans in the fight against bus segregation. I wanna begin by thanking Kirk and Sharon Prophet for funding my fellowship, which began in December, 2019. I also wanna thank EMU Engage and Jewish Studies for all of their support. My fellowship coincided with my sabbatical where I spent January, February and parts of March researching this project before lockdown. I was able to conduct my research at the Library of Congress, the National Archives and the Western Reserve Historical Society. On January 5th, 2021, the twin victories of Georgia candidates John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock to the, to the US Senate sparked many conversations about the historic alliance between Jewish Americans and African Americans. This partnership had a history. In the post-war black freedom struggle in the United States, Jewish Americans were some of the most visible white allies whether it was the brutal murders of Andrew Goodman and Michael Schwerner, the iconic image of Martin Luther King with his hands clasped next to Rabbi Heschel at the Selma March, or the formidable legal team of Jack Greenberg, Thurgood Marshall, and Constance Baker Motley, who argued Brown v. Board of Education. Indeed, throughout the 20th century, Jewish Americans have been outspoken about a range of Black civil rights matters, including economic inequality, racial segregation, and violence. And Jewish Americans were also active in the fight against bus segregation. In 1961, a group of 436 black and white freedom riders boarded buses that began in Washington DC and snaked down into the deep South, testing the enforcement of Supreme Court cases that outlawed interstate bus segregation. Jewish Americans composed two thirds of the white riders, including Israel Dresner, who earned the worthy title as the most arrested rabbi in America. Members of the American Jewish Congress wired telegrams to Attorney General Robert Kennedy, protesting this racial violence and pressing for the federal government to intervene. Not only did Jewish organizations express their support for integration of interstate transportation, but they also championed the end of segregation on citywide buses. In 1956, Sidney Hollander, the committee chair of the American Jewish Congress, invited Martin Luther King Jr. to deliver the opening plenary at the organization's biennial convention in Miami Beach, Florida. Here, King recounted his two-year involvement with the Montgomery bus boycott, where mostly working class black women marched with their feet in defiance of the violence and humiliation of Montgomery buses. For Sidney Hollander, hearing King's narrative of the bus boycott must have resonated deeply. Hollander's Maryland-based pharmaceutical company employed several Black women as office cleaners. In the early 1940s, when one of these employees attempted to buy a Greyhound bus ticket for a family visit to Virginia, agents refused to serve her. After several unsuccessful attempts, Sidney Hollander intervened, and he purchased the ticket himself, handing it to his employee. But then the agents refused to check her bag, which meant that she had to drag her heavy luggage during transfers. Sidney Hollander was so disturbed by these, quote, discriminatory attitudes that he wrote to the Interstate Commerce Commission and recommended that they conduct an investigation into the Greyhound Bus Corporation. His letter also reached the desk of National Association for the Advancement of Colored People's Chief Legal Counsel Thurgood Marshall, who agreed with Hollander, noting that Greyhound was a, quote, longtime offender. Sidney Hollander's actions against bus segregation fit into a larger history of Jewish Americans, mostly immigrants, who served as critical allies in this struggle from the 1920s until the 1940s. Jewish Americans' activism and solidarity in the interwar era laid the foundation for this iconic alliance that flourished in the post-war period and still resonates today. 
The roots of this Black Jewish relationship can be traced to the early 20th century. Waves of anti-Semitism in Europe prompted 2 million Jewish citizens to immigrate from Eastern Europe to the United States, settling in large urban centers along the East Coast and the Midwest. These cities were also home to thousands of recently migrated Black Southerners who also fled their homeland. Even though Jewish immigrants and Black migrants often labored in separate jobs, they encountered each other as distant neighbors or, or as customers and proprietors. When Jewish immigrants arrived in the United States, they often settled in neighborhoods on the borders of Black neighborhoods. Jewish immigrants also operated small businesses in Black neighborhoods, selling groceries, furniture, and clothing, and some even hired Black employees. These business relationships knit even tighter bonds of familiarity between these communities. Even if they did not meet each other in these contexts, Jewish Americans and African Americans boarded the same streetcars and buses. By the early 1920s, the commercial bus industry appeared in the United States. Buses were cheaper than trains, could transport passengers to more locations, and were branded as an inexpensive form of transportation. By 1925, there were 6,500 bus companies that transported passengers throughout the United States, as well as Canada and Mexico. But when the stock market crashed in 1929, Greyhound absorbed many of these smaller lines and became the largest company in the nation. By the mid-1930s, more Americans were riding buses than trains. On most Greyhound buses, Black passengers were subject to a color line, whether it was exclusion, racial segregation, or racial violence. And on the one hand, this is unsurprising, because in the United States in the 1920s and 1930s, nearly every aspect of American culture was segregated, typified in water fountains, um, schools, or department stores. But buses were different because conflicts over racial segregation on a bus increasingly turned violent. White bus drivers enforced the color line through verbal assaults, physical abuse, and by the late 1930s, bullets and pistols. Most white Americans were largely silent about the discriminatory attitudes and racial violence of white bus drivers and white bus corporations with one major exception, Jewish Americans, many of whom were recent immigrants to the United States. As Jewish immigrants were grappling with their identity and becoming Jewish Americans, many wove Black solidarity into their articulation of, of rights in the United States, performing what I term empathetic citizenship. As new immigrants learning the intricacies of the United States citizenship practices, Jewish Americans pledged allegiance to their new homeland by offering mournful solidarity in the struggle for Black equality. Through their words and actions, Jewish Americans highlighted the fragility of American democracy that was predicated on a racial hierarchy. First-generation Jewish Americans were sensitive to bus segregation precisely because it mirrored the anti-Semitism that they had experienced in many European countries. For Jewish Americans, these systems of discrimination provoked both a visceral reaction and a call to action. Jewish Americans were far more likely to sit near Black passengers, and they risked their physical safety to intervene in bus segregation. There was a strong likelihood that Black and Jewish passengers would encounter, encounter each other on a bus. Jewish Americans were the first working class community in the United States to embrace vacations, and they often rode buses to visit Atlantic City or the Catskills, while Black migrants traveled by bus to sustain their familial connections in the South. Even though they were coded as white, Jewish passengers crossed racial boundaries to side with black riders. Not only did Jewish Americans risk their safety, but they also spoke out at a moment of both heightened anti-Semitism in the United States, as well as stringent opposition to Jewish immigration. These loud protests from Jewish Americans reverberated alongside the silence from other white Americans for whom Jim Crow was an established institution. Sidney Hollander serves as a crucial link between this earlier period of activism and the post-war Black freedom struggle. Beginning in the 1920s, Jewish Americans emerged as the strongest white allies in the fight for bus integration, whether they were ordinary bus passengers, lawyers, or members of civil rights organizations. Through their steadfast work and allyship, Jewish Americans joined African Americans in making Black civil rights an issue about the fate of American democracy and this movement began on the bus. In July 1927, Samuel S. Siegel, a Jewish immigrant from Romania, was enjoying a relaxing vacation in South Haven, Michigan, 
This resort town, popularly known as the Catskills of the Midwest, attracted many Jewish families in the summer months. While he was waiting at a Greyhound bus terminal to take him back to his home in Chicago, Siegel, a tailor in a fur shop, witnessed a well-dressed black man clutching a ticket for his destination of Benton Harbor, Michigan. When this man showed his ticket to the white driver, he shoved him aside and allowed two white passengers to board the bus. Horrified, Samuel Siegel approached the man and expressed his disgust at the behavior he had just witnessed. Siegel assured the man that he would stay with him so that he could board the next bus. A few hours later, when the two men boarded that bus, a passenger alerted the driver that there was a black man. He swiftly marched over to the African-American man, called him a dirty drunkard, and demanded that he exit immediately. He also threatened to use physical violence. Siegel intervened, questioning why the driver was engaging in such behavior. It was Siegel's actions that caused the driver to defuse the situation. When Samuel Siegel returned home in Chicago, to Chicago, he penned a letter to the city's Black newspaper, the Chicago Defender. Narrating the incident in vivid detail, Siegel described the violent behavior of the bus driver. And in his letter, he said, as a member of the Jewish race, which is also and is still subjected to uncivilized persecution, I deeply and sincerely resent such incidents. By acknowledging past and present patterns of anti-Semitism, Siegel rhetorically linked the fate of Jewish Americans and African Americans. There are several important things in Siegel's letter. First, he mentions that he's a member of the Jewish race, perhaps to equate his otherness with that of African Americans. And through his words and actions, Siegel let Black subscribers of the Chicago Defender know that he was a Jewish passenger who deeply disapproved of these policies. For African Americans, reading Siegel's letter might have offered them a bit of comfort that there were some white Americans who were their allies on the bus. A few years later, Maurice Roosboom, a Jewish immigrant from Amsterdam, was traveling on a Greyhound bus in Westchester County, New York. Roosboom worked as a salesman at a rubber company. He had immigrated to the United States in the 1910s, but interestingly enough, the same month that he has an incident on the bus, he actually um, is in the process of becoming a naturalized citizen of the United States. Once he boards the bus in Connecticut, he's immediately displeased with the driver. Um, it's very late in the evening, and he feels that the driver is not really paying attention to his job. He's actually focused on this blonde woman who's sitting up front. When the bus stopped in Stamford, Connecticut, a 20-year-old Black woman named Eleanor Toole boards the bus, and the driver ordered her to move to the back, where there was not a single empty seat. Toole labored as a live-in servant for a wealthy family, which was an exhausting job. Rather than being able to rest and relax on her trip, she had to stand on a dark and shaky bus. Surprised that his fellow passengers did not protest this shameful action, Roosboom intervened and suggested that Toole take a seat near the front. When the driver threatened to eject both Roosboom and Toole from the bus, he bravely told the driver that he was treating his passengers with bulldozing tactics and acted toward Toole in a most discourteous manner. After exchanging these sharp words with the bus driver, Roosboom informed him that he would be contacting Greyhound to highlight this clear case of racial discrimination. Like Samuel Siegel, Maurice Roosboom intervened when he witnessed injustice. On a bus traveling late into the night, this was a dangerous act. The very next day, Maurice Roosboom sent a letter to Greyhound. Highlighting the disrespectfulness that the driver showed toward the black passenger, Roosboom politely referred to Eleanor Toole as Miss Eleanor Toole, a title rarely accorded to black women. He demanded that Greyhound immediately punish the white driver and requested an in-person meeting with the company, noting that speech had more power than words. He also reached out to the NAACP, asking them to pressure the bus company to ensure that Toole would receive an apology about her mistreatment. He ended his letter by saying, quote, yours for the elimination of all prejudices, thereby linking the common oppression of African Americans and Jewish Americans. While Maurice Roosboom and Samuel Siegel bore witness to individual cases of bus discrimination, others protested the system entirely. In September 1944, Eleanor Gutman, the daughter of Russian immigrants, was traveling around the country collecting signatures to put Norman Thomas on the ballot for president. When she stopped at a Greyhound restaurant, she rejected the cafe's segregated seating arrangement and opted to sit in the colored section. 
police officers immediately arrested Gutman for attempting to create a race incident. And newspaper articles detailing her arrest raced through the black press, letting readers know that a white woman, the daughter of Jewish immigrants, opted for black protest over white privilege. And Sidney Hollander, aforementioned, discovered these racist practices not as a passenger, but as an employer. And unlike the Jewish men who came before him, Sidney Hollander was not a recent immigrant from Eastern Europe, but rather a prominent German businessman whose family traced their ancestry back to the United States for generations. Cumulatively, the disconnected figures of Samuel Siegel, Maurice Roosboom, Sidney Hollander, and Eleanor Gutman all connected to serve as critical allies in the fight against bus segregation. By directly confronting the systems of discrimination, Jewish Americans articulated this vision of empathetic citizenship predicated on racial equality. By the late 1930s, Greyhound began to train their bus drivers to act as police officers. This is an image from Greyhound's company publication, The Highway Traveler. Um, and this is really meant to be kind of a gentle image. You can see that it depicts a white bus driver who's encountering two white boys on a sandy beach in Florida. Since the opening of Dixie Highway in 1915, Greyhound is always promoting travel in Florida. But up close, you can see that this bus driver has a gun in his holster as part of his uniform. And by the 1930s, Greyhound has begun to style its bus uniforms to look like police uniforms. So if you look at this image of police officers in the 1930s and this bus driver, you can see that they both uniforms involve boots, caps, badges, and especially guns. It's unclear why Greyhound chose to model their bus drivers on police officers, but by the late 1930s, every Southern state has begun to deputize bus drivers as officers of the peace, enabling them to carry guns and make citizens arrests. During World War II, racial tensions explode on all forms of transportation, but were especially pronounced on buses. Only a few days after the United States enters World War II, President Franklin D. Roosevelt signs Executive Order 8989, which creates the Office of Defense Transportation to coordinate its vast transportation programs. The ODT signs contracts with the Greyhound Bus Corporation and other smaller lines to transport civilians, soldiers, and even Japanese internment camp evacuees to destinations across the country. The fact that the Office of Defense Transportation partners with Greyhound makes the federal government a complicit actor in, in racial violence and bus violence. During World War II, the NAACP establishes a legal defense fund, and the legal defense fund handles bus segregation cases. Thurgood Marshall chairs the office, and he's assisted by the Jewish attorney Milton Convitz. A native of Safed in what was then Palestine and is now Israel, Convitz's family moves to New York City in the early 20th century. And Milton Convitz yearns to be an academic. He completes his undergraduate work at NYU and Cornell um, and receives a PhD as well as a law degree. But because of such anti-Semitism in the academy, Milton Convitz is unable to secure an academic position. So in the late 1930s, he works with the New Jersey Housing Authority, and in 1942, he joins the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund. During his tenure with the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund, Milton Convitz assists 12 African Americans who experience bus segregation. In some cases, there was very little that Convitz could do. While humiliating, it was legal for states like Georgia or Alabama to require black passengers to sit in the back of the bus if the buses were traveling in state. <coughs> Excuse me. But most black passengers alerted the NAACP when they were segregated on buses traveling across state lines, which raised the issue of the legality of interstate transportation segregation. Milton Convitz handled several cases of black women who were abused at the hands of bus drivers, stranded in unfamiliar locations or subject to racial violence. It was a deeply radical act for Milton Convitz, a Jewish immigrant from Palestine, to handle these cases and serve as an intermediary between these black women and white bus drivers who worked at every moment to undermine their dignity. 
But when black soldiers wearing army uniforms appeal appealed to the NAACP about similar types of conflicts, Convitz was able to exert more leverage in the fight for integrated transportation. In March 1943, Corporal Reuben Pleasant, a native of Fort George, Maryland, was traveling back to his base in Alabama, which was called Maxwell Field. On a city bus in Montgomery, Pleasant took a seat near the front in defiance of the strict segregation policies. The white bus driver, Loomis Farmer, grabbed his pistol and shot Reuben Pleasant in the leg. As soon as the NAACP learned about the case, Milton Convitz and other lawyers pressed both the War Department and the Department of Justice to intervene. Loomis Farmer was not the only white bus driver to assault Black men and women in the military. At this point, the NAACP had already handled several cases, but struggled to convince the War Department and the Department of Justice to take action. But with the Reuben Pleasant case, lawyers felt glimmers of progress appear when the War Department suggested that they might take, quote, appropriate punitive action to try civilians who mistreated soldiers on and off the base. This news caused leaders at the NAACP to feel optimistic, arguing that this marked the beginning of a new policy to prosecute the white men who wantonly attacked Black soldiers. In a follow-up to the War Department, Convicts expressed optimism that this proposed policy might serve as a quote unquote precedent for future cases. Only one month after the shooting of Reuben Pleasant, the NAACP learned about the assault of Charles O. Lightfoot, a 29 year old sergeant who was stationed at Camp McCain, a military base in the deep south city of Grenada, Mississippi. In April 1943, Charles Lightfoot boarded a tri-state bus at the terminal in Jackson to return to his base. During the journey, as more and more passengers boarded the bus, the white driver ordered all black passengers to stand to accommodate white passengers. Lightfoot did not hear this order, causing the white driver to march over to him and shout, I'll teach you to move when a white man speaks and began to hit him on the head with a pair of ticket punchers. And so these are actual ticket punchers um, that I found on the internet from the 1940s. Lightfoot reached into his pocket and grabbed his knife to fend off the driver. A white Lieutenant intervened to protect Lightfoot from the violent bus driver. When the bus pulled into Starkville, Mississippi, the driver ordered Lightfoot off the bus. When he exited the bus, a mob of 25 white soldiers crowded around him, presumably to murder him in an act of extra legal violence. The town sheriff and two state troopers swiftly arrived. Eyewitnesses reported that rather than ending the violence, they continued to beat Lightfoot with clubs and blackjacks for 30 minutes before arresting him and depositing him in the Starkville County Jail. When Lightfoot returned to his military base, he found that he had already faced a preliminary hearing where he was charged with intent to kill and murder. He wrote to the NAACP from a place of sheer desperation. I hope it's in your power, he pleaded, to send me a lawyer. Reassuring the NAACP of his innocence and his desire to be a free man, he stated that he would be deeply grateful for your help. Aware of the sheer importance of Charles Lightfoot's case, Milton Convitz took an aggressive approach. He sent the case for review at the NAACP's office in Washington, DC, and he also contacted the War Department. He stayed in touch with Charles Lightfoot's sister, letting her know that the Washington office of the NAACP was investigating the case. Milton Convitz's advocacy with the War Department paid off. In June 1943, Truman Gibson from the War Department sent a letter to NAACP attorney Convitz, informing him that his office was carefully examining the whole problem of transportation and that the issue was under scrutiny. This was a breakthrough. Through his efforts, Milton Convitz had convinced the War Department about the severity of the problem. One year later, the War Department issued Memorandum Number 92, which stated that buses traveling on military bases should not subject their Black soldiers to racial segregation. And so this memo ever gradually paved the way for the slow desegregation of transportation. But the order came too little too late. During World War II, bus drivers shot and killed at least six Black soldiers over conflicts over bus segregation, and no driver was ever punished for his actions. As a Jewish immigrant, Milton Convitz was a powerful ally for African-Americans and embodied the very best in interracial cooperation. 
In an era when most white Americans did not flinch in their attitudes toward racial segregation or interracial violence, Convitz demonstrated an ethic of care in his advocacy work for the NAACP. In 1944, he departed the NAACP and joined the New School of Industrial and Labor Relations at Cornell University. One year after joining the faculty, he published the landmark book, The Constitution and Civil Rights, which outlined a path for the Supreme Court to dismantle racial segregation across a variety of American institutions. At the same time that he fought for Black civil rights, he also highlighted discrimination against Asian Americans, publishing another landmark textbook, The Alien and the Asiatic in American Law, where he offered sharp critiques of the Japanese internment program. He also taught thousands of students in his very popular classes and corresponded with them over the years, including future Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. In the aftermath of World War II, leaders at the NAACP continued to highlight the violence of bus segregation. In June 1946, Isaac Woodard, a 26-year-old soldier from New York, was discharged from Camp Gordon in Georgia and boarded a Greyhound bus for, headed for South Carolina to see his wife. On the bus, Woodard had protested the segregated seating arrangement with the white bus driver, who evicted him from the vehicle. The driver immediately handed Woodard over to a white police officer named Leonard Schull, who beat him mercilessly and gouged out both of his eyeballs. Woodard survived the attack, but his loss of eyesight became a compelling symbol of the brutality of white bus drivers and officers who police soldiers in the Jim Crow South. And so here I do want to acknowledge that today is Veterans Day, and Isaac Woodard was a war veteran who bore the scars of World War II and Jim Crow. Once newspapers began to report about this assault, leaders at the NAACP made Isaac Woodard the public face of Jim Crow violence. Gloucester Current, the field secretary for the NAACP, outlined the organization's public relations strategy. Current recommended that the NAACP mobilize veterans, labor unions, civic groups, and social organizations. Tellingly, Current listed only one religious community to contact, Jewish groups. At this moment, Jewish Americans composed 3.7% of the population in the United States, one of the smallest religious communities, yet the group that the NAACP identified as a key ally in their fight to secure justice for Isaac Woodard. Jewish Americans and organizations clamored to speak out and publicize the Woodard case. As a community, Jewish people were reeling from the aftershock of the brutal Holocaust, where 11 million people had perished at the hands of a totalitarian regime in the Nazi party. This devastation unequivocally demonstrated the dangerous consequences of anti-Semitism. Scholars have argued that the Holocaust only strengthened the blank Black Jewish alliance in the United States, and this is really discernible in the Jewish reaction to Isaac Woodard's assault. In the aftermath of Gloucester Current's call for Jewish solidarity, letters of support poured into the NAACP offices. Dozens of individuals and organizations chimed in, publicly mourning this American tragedy, including the American Jewish Congress, the American Jewish Committee, the Anti-Defamation League, and the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, which was largely composed of Jewish women. Mr. B. Harper, who was a representative of the American Jewish Council of New York, wrote that his organization was dedicated to working with the NAACP, and they would alert all their members and friends. Not only did Jewish Americans denounce the brutality through their organizations, but individual citizens also offered their personal lamentations. In particular, leftist Jewish women were outspoken about the Woodard case and sent messages to the NAACP and the federal government tinged with implicit and explicit references to the Holocaust and the dangers of white supremacy in the United States. In June 1946, Eva Robin, a Russian Jewish immigrant and prominent member of leftist organizations, wrote a scathing letter to the Department of Justice. Robin told the Attorney General that she burned with indignation about Woodard's assault. She remarked that Hitler is dead, but his spirit is carried on with Southern white supremacy, which she labeled as an act of terrorism. She ended her letter by noting that she was a loyal citizen of the United States and that two of her children had personally served in the war as a doctor and a nurse. 
Two months later, Ethel S. Epstein, an attorney who worked for, as the labor secretary for Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia, donated $250 to Woodard's legal defense, a significant contribution in the 1940s. Epstein argued that the blame for Woodard's brutality must be shared by the whole nation. In this statement, Epstein argued that racism and prejudice were not simply isolated acts, but rather a burden that the entire nation needed to overcome. And at a rally of 31,000 people for Woodard's defense in New York City, the Jewish actress Hilda Strauss Vaughn stated that the crowd size was a reflection of the unbelievable tragedy. We hope, Vaughn reflected, that Isaac Woodard's loss of vision may give us a little extra vision. Despite so many pleas for justice, Isaac Woodard never received any. An all-white jury in South Carolina deliberated for 30 minutes before acquitting Officer Leonard Schull of all charges, except his admission that he had attacked Woodard. This acquittal led President Harry Truman to establish a civil rights commission and appoint an interracial group of 15 men and women to serve, including Rabbi Roland L. Gittleshawn, who you see here on the screen. In the 1960s, when Jewish freedom riders were jailed for their protests, Rabbi Gittleshawn implored his fellow Southern rabbis to visit with the activists, thereby offering a crucial link between Woodard's assault and similar attacks on the freedom riders. Between 1926 and 1946, Jewish Americans rode in solidarity with Black passengers. Risking their lives and potentially their livelihood, Jewish immigrants bore witness to discrimination and protested racial segregation at a time when there was not a nationally coordinated Black freedom struggle. Articulating a discourse of empathetic citizenship, Jewish men and women wove solidarity with the Black freedom movement into their Americanization process. Together, Jewish immigrants and Black Southern migrants laid the foundation for the Freedom Rides as they modeled an example of interracial cooperation for fellow riders to witness. Even though Jewish Americans embodied a complexity of ethnicities, Dutch, German, Romanian, Russian, and Sephetic, they all united around a common solidarity with African-American passengers. The moral issue of bus segregation galvanized Jewish Americans from all walks of life, stretching from elite businessmen like Sidney Hollander to lawyer Milton Convitz to recent immigrants like Samuel Siegel, Maurice Roosboom, and outspoken leftist women like Eva Robin and Ethel Epstein. Over a period of 20 years, these men and women rejected the comforts of a white section and moved to the back of the bus. Thank you. Stop me. screen. <laughs> Let me stop my share. So, um, I mean, personally moving and inspiring, I mean, just really amazing um, dispute. Um, uh, I mean, I'm <clears throat> it's amazing what we know and what we don't know. So, uh, so grateful for you. And um, giving voice uh, to this particular part of a history that many of us may not know of and can and, and hopefully want to know more. So we want to take some time for questions first, but before we do that, um, two things. I want to really give a shout out to Aaron McGarger. I didn't do this in the beginning because we're getting coordinated and our GA and engaged. So a shout out to Aaron who's been coordinating this. So thanks, Aaron. I'm so grateful for you and your time and expertise and really grateful. Uh, so what we're gonna do um, for questions is we have some time for questions and two things. Um, we wanna make sure my, uh, my colleague and uh, uh, com compatriot here, uh, Dr. Shipman, uh, we just wanna clarify the kind of questioning um, we're, we we're hoping to facilitate here. So, um, you know, we, there's a lot of people that have their own personal experiences, but we really wanna go to questions. So Marty, can, we, can you give us an example here of the kinds of things we may not be looking for um, uh, as, we, as we embark on our question and answer session? Marty. Absolutely. <laughs> so, I really don't have a question. Yeah. Uh, I what I have is a comment, and it, it's going to be very, very long and extremely self-indulgent because I believe I have the right to do that. 
And I, I often say this at, at, at scholarly conferences because uh -huh. I do this there as well. Yeah, uh -huh. now, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my uncle Lizzie and Aunt Mildred, who okay. lived in Miami. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, okay. what I'm going to tell you has absolutely nothing to do. Okay, with... well, thank you, Marty, so much. I'm so that is I, I have no doubt that your uncle Lizzie and Aunt Franny and her cousin Joe and 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 and, and neighbor Larry are exceptional people and have probably ridden a bus at some time in their life. But what we <laughs> maybe. <really haven't... laughs> <laughs> what we really want to do is try to create some thoughtful things. That said, if you do have personal experiences that are really inspired by Dr. Murphy's presentations, we would love you to share them in the chat. If there's a family member or something else that you want to sort of allude to, please do that. So two things. We are going to have questions in the chat, but we also can raise your hand um, and also call on you as well. And Aaron's going to help facilitate that. Um, if you want a close-up of Dr. Murphy, you can just go into the view on the upper right hand part of your Zoom and you can click speaker and that will also allow you to do that. So questions in the chat, Aaron's gonna DJ. Uh, we can also, Marty and I are gonna sort of facilitate because um, I know there's lots of questions. So uh, let us go. Um, and Aaron, and you are on deck. So if there's <laughs> questions or comment, or questions, I wanna say questions. If you'd like to raise your hand, you can click reactions and raise hand at the bottom or put your question in the chat. Um, yes, and this lecture is being recorded. Um, I am recording it and we will, I'm, I'm not sure if we've decided yet how we're gonna be. Aaron, what we will try to do is um, the Center for Jewish Studies will get in touch with you and we will post it on the CJS YouTube site. All right. All right. Um, All right, we have a question here uh, from Harvey Summers. Did any state try to force Greyhound to stop onboard segregation? Um, so that's a fantastic question. Um, so the one place where African Americans were able to find a little bit of justice in bus segregation is through the law. Um, and so I have several cases from the late 1920s and early 1930s where Black women in the Midwest, when they were subject to bus segregation, they challenged it and they took Greyhound to court. And in the Midwest, they were victorious because Midwestern states like Ohio and Illinois and Michigan all have civil rights laws. Um, and so there are a handful of white judges, including one in Ann Arbor, that actually side with Black women over bus corporations. Um, but then after the late 1930s, as bus travel just becomes much more common, um, there, these lawsuits kind of die down um, and white judges stop um, kind of siding with Black plaintiffs. Um, but then by the early, by the late 19th, I would say by the period of World War II, however, actually in the South, um, some white judges conclude that it's just really impossible to have a system of racial segregation on a bus because it's just such a small space and it's a burden for everybody to try to enforce these policies. So there are also a handful of important um, court cases that come out of the South as well. Awesome. Um, I see Jessica Lewinberger has your hand raised. I'm going to ask you to unmute. You can go ahead and ask your question. Okay, thank you. A great presentation. I was just wondering what uh, anecdote or what story um, moved you the most throughout your research? Um, thank you. That's a great question. They all did. Um, but I would say that the outpouring of support for Isaac Woodard was incredibly, um, it, it was just really, really moving. Um, and in particular as well, um, you know, I wasn't sure who was Jewish in my research. Um, I wasn't sure if I was actually researching Jewish Americans or not. I had kind of a, a hunch based on some last names. So for me, a lot of the kind of revelatory moments came when I went through the census because I would have a letter from someone like Eva Robin 
And then I would look her up in the census and I would realize her family history and I would realize that she was a recent immigrant. And so for me, it was kind of connecting the, the text and the substance of what these activists were saying with their family stories and realizing that they were really recent immigrants to the United States. They had fought really hard to come over here. And the United States is a hard place. It's not easy to be an immigrant. Um, and yet they were standing up for justice at a time when a lot of white Americans were not. That is great to hear. Wow. Um, so next we have Joseph Nathanson, who is wondering whether uh, any Jewish activists were subjected to repercussions or any violence against them. It's a great question. Yeah, um, I didn't find any evidence of it in the research that I did for this particular project, but I'm sure it existed. But um, because I'm in history, um, I cannot say for certain. Um, but I can say that a lot of white freedom riders, um, especially Jewish freedom riders, were beaten and assaulted on buses. Um, and they paid a lot of, there was a huge physical toll for participating um, in the modern Black freedom struggle. So I know, I'm sure it existed. I just didn't have any evidence that I could point to for this presentation. All right. Next, I see here, Charles, uh, is there a connection between the Jewish NAACP lawyers and those of the ILD who defended, for example, the Scottsboro boys? Um, there certainly are. And so some of the, I only highlighted one Jewish lawyer who was working at the NAACP at the time because he handled best segregation cases. Um, but there was a community of white leftist lawyers, some of whom were Jewish, some of whom were not, that were involved in the ILD and the Communist Party um, that were involved in other civil rights activities as well. All right. Uh, justice. Uh, let's see, did your research indicate if there was greater Jewish solidarity, solidarity among European born Jews who had personal experience with the Holocaust or American born Jews who had experienced uh, prejudice in the US? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So the Eastern European Jewish people that I highlighted were people like Samuel Siegel and Maurice Rusboom um, and Eva Robin, and they were not themselves um, the direct victims of the Holocaust, but I know they had relatives um, who would have been affected by it. Um, so they were just kind of speaking out, you know, at an earlier period. So I think there's a couple of reasons why Eastern European immigrants are so prominent in this presentation. Um, the first is that there were 2 million that came over in this time period. So it was a huge demographic shift in the United States. Um, and the second thing is that the arrival of Eastern European Jewish people kind of coincides with these major changes that are taking place in the transportation system in the United States. Um, and but I do think that, you know, these 2 million Eastern European Jewish immigrants are coming over because of anti-Semitism. They are kicked out of their homeland. Um, and so I do think that that is providing this incredibly visceral reaction. That is why they are so stunned when they come face to face with Southern white supremacy. And so certainly that's not to discount anti-Semitism in the United States. Um, but it just was so striking to me to see the bravery and courage of Eastern European immigrants that had um, the determination to speak out against um, white supremacy. Great. Um, hmm. This might be more of a rhetorical question, this next one. <laughs> um, let me see. Did we miss opportunities after bus segregation to help destroy white supremacy in the USA? Well, not sure about that one, but... <laughs> I guess, do you have any comments on that one? I don't think white supremacy has been destroyed in the United States. Um, I think it's still <laughs> an issue <laughs> um, that people have been dealing with. But um, I do think that, uh, I do think that there was a lot of hope and momentum, um, especially after Woodard's assaults and especially with the freedom rides of the 1960s. And I think it's important for us to go back and think about those historical lessons in our current moment. 
All right, um, let's see. We're, uh, let's see, so many of your examples involved Greyhound. Uh, were there any examples or practices from other bus companies that were worse than Greyhound or similar? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's a little hard to know because, as I said, in the 19, in the early 1920s, there are 6,500 different bus companies. So it's hard for us to understand that Greyhound would become the giant that it is. Um, but interestingly enough, I have I would argue that Greyhound is definitively the worst offender um, because in other instances when um, black women or black men would initiate lawsuits against these companies, um, these companies would then contact the NAACP or they would have a race relations summit or they would intervene with their drivers. Greyhound never makes any efforts um, to change its racial practices and its racial practices only get worse um, by the late 1930s and 1940s. And I think you can see that in the kind of policing culture um, that they create with their drivers. I have a follow up question for that. Um, did you uh, see a point in your research where that changed um, with Greyhound or where they were forced to change? Yeah, that's a great question. So my research stops um, around 1950. Um, so I don't know the moment when Greyhound will change its company practices. Um, but one thing that I think is really interesting are the ways that Greyhound sort of becomes this major company at the time that municipal um, bus companies emerge. So now every city has a bus. And so I would imagine for everybody, the most notorious bus company will be the Montgomery, <laughs> the, the buses in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, and so it's really interesting to think about the connections between the behavior of a Greyhound bus driver and a city bus driver. Um, and I would argue that Greyhound kind of shapes that culture of bus driving. Thanks for that. Jackie, did you have a question? You're muted. <laughs> I mean, I didn't make a comment uh, about Integrity First for America, which I think is really interesting because that's a Jewish powered sort of organization that is countering and sort of championing the um, case in Charlottesville. So it is really interesting that the, the court system is the way in which even now, a lot of Jewish organizations or individuals are, are seeking <clears throat> to get justice. But my question actually is more so on a little sort of uh, something you mentioned at the end, um, Emmy, which was like, regardless if they were Romanian Jews or from Amsterdam or German Jews, they all had this kind of sort of coalesced. Did you find anything in your um in your study, in your research that sort of elevated that or the idea that there was this real intentional kind of collective because I, I keep thinking about, you know, my own my family's experiences German Jews versus Russian Jews and how they were kind of not allowed to sort of intermingle and things of like that or they were discouraged so I'm, I'm kind of curious in any of your research there. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I can't speak to specifics, but I think I can speak to like the issue of, of spaces and of um, kind of Jewish institutions. And I think that um, it's, it's pretty clear to me, um, and I need to speak more about this, that the, the immigrants that I'm writing about were kind of making their opinions public. And so they were taking these experiences into their synagogues and into their labor organizations. Um, and so it wasn't just this kind of like linear back and forth conversation. It was a really kind of community um, issue. And I think that they were educating each other about what they were seeing and experiencing. Um, and that leads me to believe that, yeah, there was this kind of collective consciousness. I don't, I don't know if a figure like Sidney Hollander <laughs> would ever interact with someone um, like uh, Maurice Roosboom, but um, it's, it's striking that they had the similar reaction, even if they weren't necessarily socializing in the same space. But, you know, maybe Maurice Roosboom came to Sydney Hollander's convention um, in Miami Beach in the 50s. That would be interesting. Did you have a whole, Marty, whole I saw your hand. Oh, what was that? Okay. <laughs> I saw your hand raised, Marty. Did you still have a question or comment? I, I, I do have, I mean, so I remember taking Greyhound down south during the mid-19, mid and late 1960s. And 
it, it seemed the great preponderance of the, of the drivers were white Southerners. Um, was this a hiring practice or is it just sort of how I'm remembering things? No, I, I think you're spot on. Um, so one of the issues that I'm looking at is how, okay, so Greyhound is a company that is founded in Hibing, Hibing, it's founded in Minnesota in, I believe, 1917. And it's initially founded to transport miners. Um, so they have this kind of like little wagon that they eventually call a bus. And it's founded by a Swedish immigrant named Carl Wickman. Um, and by the late 1920s, Greyhound um, kind of becomes a publicly traded company and um, they establish a corporate headquarters in Cleveland. And my research has demonstrated that even though Greyhound is founded in the Midwest, they do everything in their power to align themselves with the cultural mores of the Jim Crow South. Um, and so I showed you um, an image from Highway Traveler. Um, I've gone through every issue of Highway Traveler in this period. And um, so if you purchased a Greyhound bus ticket, they would give you this magazine. It's kind of like the proto in flight magazine. And um, bus drivers were not called drivers. They were called tour guides. And they were taking you on tours throughout the United States. And the highway traveler is just brimming with some of the worst stories I've ever heard. I mean, they are so derogatory toward, they have these travel articles. So they're really derogatory toward African-Americans, but also Latinx people, immigrants. Um, it's just very, very derogatory. And one of the reasons I think that is, is that in 1915, Dixie Highway opens. And so this is this big highway that goes from Michigan all the way down to Florida. And Greyhound is trying to get as many routes as they can on Dixie Highway. Um, and so they're trying to align themselves with Jim Crow, but also they only hire white men, non-immigrants um, who will be their bus drivers. So Greyhound has a huge market in the South. So I think what you're seeing in the 60s um, is a reflection of what they've been doing in the company since the late 1920s. That's really interesting. Wow. Well, we have time for about one more question. If anybody wants to volunteer, raise your hand, put it in the chat, don't be shy. Anyone want to volunteer? Anyone, anyone? I do want to say that it was like listening <clears throat> to you, Emmy and Dr. Murphy. And I keep thinking about all the possibilities of where you could be speaking this particular presentation. I mean, I, I mean, I feel like I'm looking at Jewish community centers across the country and black churches. I mean, I just feel there's an opportunity to be able to share and, and, and lift up this particular part of our history in, in many different places. So um, it's not really, I know I, I broke my rule of a comment, but still it was a comment. <laughs> oh, well, I wanna thank everybody for being so supportive of this research. Um, this oh. fellowship is really such a privilege um, and I was really honored to receive it and to share this with all of you this evening. It's really remarkable. And thank you so much. Are there other fi final comments or questions or Marty, you have some final thoughts or? Yes, Harvey. You have a final thought, you're muted, Harvey. Oh, I can unmute you. Unmute, Aaron, there you go. Okay, thank you. I could not unmute. My question is, what are you gonna do next? <laughs> Um, so I'm in the process of finishing this book called Policing Passengers. And so in this book, I'm looking at 200 black women who protested um, segregation and racial violence on buses in the period that I've outlined. Um, and so I'm looking at kind of like exposés in newspapers, but one of my big chapters is about, I found over 63 lawsuits that black women wage against bus corporations. Um, and so basically I'm trying to write the prehistory of the Montgomery bus boycott. Um, and show that black women were really active in um, bus segregation protests way before Rosa Parks. I feel a theatrical presentation there as well. <laughs> so we'll, 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 we'll find some uh, synergies there to synthesize. Unbelievable, Dr. Murphy, really just brilliant and inspiring and what an honor to have you in your expertise in this space and be our inaugural fellow. Um, it's really, it's really an honor. Um, I wanna thank my colleague and, and partner, Marty Schickmans, uh, Director of Center for Jewish Studies. Uh, please come see our Hanukkah party, the Hanukkah event on the 7th. 8th. 
eight, ay, at seven. Um, in the EMU Student Center, it is bluegrass. Donnie Slasloff and Eric Lindbergh, Jews, bluegrass, and other American music. And we want to thank, um, once again, Dr. Murphy and Aaron and all of you for coming on this lovely evening. And we'll, we'll see you either virtually or face-to-face -face soon. We also want to thank Kirk and Sharon Prophet. Yes, for, we want to thank him. He's yes. texting me. He's like, got an event. He apologizes greatly, but that's why we have it recorded. We want to thank Kirk and Sharon for having fun with us and we continue to do more fellowships like this. So we're thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, Mary Elizabeth. It was brilliant. Thank you. Brilliant. Phenomenal.